I saw that very many people were sort of, you know, swimming the Tiber or swimming the Bos Bosphorus, very ardently and zealously becoming Roman Catholic after what I thought were rather minimal, you know, periods of, of uh, investigation and research. I think, in fact, that the, the common arguments that convince people to become Roman Catholic are not very good at all. Um, and I think that the evidence is not actually there for Roman Catholicism. Well, hey everyone, what is up? Welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Austin and this is Gospel Simplicity, a place where we seek to bring simplicity out of theological, historical, and well, today a bit of philosophical complexity. Today I am joined by Dr. Stephen Nemesh and we are talking about his personal journey of almost becoming Catholic and then deciding not to. And in doing so, we talk about what he sees as one of the fundamental flaws of Catholicism, and it all kind of revolves around this idea of phenomenology. Now, I know that's a big word and that, I don't know about you, but that might have intimidated me if I heard that. You're probably just smarter than me, so maybe that doesn't intimidate you. But in any case, I'd really encourage you to stick around because I think it's a really interesting conversation. He has great things to say about even just the process of looking into another Christian tradition, but then he gets at an argument that I just don't think is really being put out in terms of Protestant, uh, Catholic, Orthodox. So if for nothing else, I think this will give you a, a new perspective and something to chew on and really think about there. So I, I hope you do it and I hope you enjoy it. Well, before we get to the video, I want to say a real quick thank you to my patrons, subscribers, and merch buyers who buy things like this or do you, ah, I always get it mixed up. The pillow is over. This is so hard. There. Boom. I should edit that out, but I'm not going to. Anyway, I now have pillows, which is kind of cool, and all types of stuff, so you can check that out at gospelsimplicity.com and click on the merch button or use the link in the description. I do want to say thanks to those patrons who make this possible. Thank you all so, so much. So grateful for your support. If you would like to support the channel, you can go to patreon.com slash gospelsimplicity, or you can make a one-time donation at paypal.me slash gospelsimplicity. Well, thank you all so much. We'll be right to the video. First, we're going to pay some bills real quick with this ad, and then we'll be there. If you're anything like me, you might have this vague sense that you should be investing, or maybe you actively want to invest, but you just find the whole thing a little confusing. I've been there. I totally get that. Between wondering what should you buy and where should you invest, who, which companies do you pick and when do you pick them, and on top of all of that, how do you know that your money isn't going to be supporting companies that are against your moral values? To be honest, it's all very complex, but that is where Christ-centered capital comes in. C3. C3 is an organization that exists to help you not only be a good steward of your money and be able to invest wisely by giving you timely stock picks, mock portfolios, even alternative investing opportunities like crypto and all of that and so much more, but they do it in a way that gives you ratings of these companies based on what they are supporting and whether or not they would line up with Christian moral convictions. It's amazing, so helpful, and allows you to take that investing to a more conscious level and see, is this really something that I would want to be supporting? I highly recommend you check them out, and you can do so by going to ChristCenteredCapital.com. And if you do, be sure to use the promo code C3Austin for your first month absolutely free. You don't even have to pay anything. You can see if you like it, see what kind of services they offer you. After that, it would be $7 per month, and just so you know, 50% of those profits will be going back into Christian organizations like pro-life organizations, Christian colleges, and much, much more. They're a great organization that I'm so happy to be partnering with, and again, I'd encourage you to check them out at ChristCenteredCapital.com and use the promo code C3Austin to get your first month free. Well, today I am joined by Dr. Stephen Nemesh. Dr. Stephen Nemesh holds a PhD in theology from Fuller Theological Seminary, where he wrote his dissertation titled A Constructive Theological Phenomenology of Scripture. He has published multiple articles in academic journals, and a list of these can be found on his website, stephennemesh.com, and you'll be able to find a link to that in the description. He also has a forthcoming volume in the Cambridge Element series titled Orthodoxy and Heresy in Christian Theology, or Orthodoxy and Heresy in Christian Theology is more like it. Uh, he also runs a YouTube channel under his name, Dr. Stephen Nemesh, which you should definitely check out. And most importantly, he is happily married to his wife, Rachel. Dr. Nemesh, thank you so much for coming on the channel today. Thank you for having me. 
Well, I am very excited to have this conversation. Uh, and today we're going to be kind of talking about two main things, at least I think. We'll see where we go from here. But I want to talk a bit about your story because many people come to my channel and they are attracted to the ancient faith uh, of some type. And they're trying to figure out where they should end up and where that should lead them. And they're maybe experiencing this kind of ecclesial like homelessness. And they're thinking, should I be Catholic? Should I be Orthodox? Should I be Protestant? And you've traveled this journey and you have remained Protestant. And I think it's really interesting to be able to highlight that story because my audience tends to uh, be a bit more Catholic and Orthodox. So I think this will be something a little different for them. But I also want to talk a bit about what you see as the future of Protestant theology, which I find really interesting, and it's around this idea of phenomenology. So hopefully we can pack all of that in today, and I think people are going to enjoy it. But I first came across your work and some debates you've done on topics of disagreement between Protestants and Catholics, and I'm just curious, how did you begin to get involved in these conversations, and what kind of inspires you to be involved in them? Well, I was very close to converting to Catholicism a few years ago. Um, 2016, 2017, basically, I was reading a lot of Catholic theology, a lot of uh, Joseph Ratzinger, a lot of Thomas Aquinas, and I was very much impressed with the Catholic theological system. I thought that it uh, solved certain theological problems. I thought that it had an answer or a, a good answer to very many theological questions. And I started attending RCIA when I was in the first year of my PhD at Fuller in 2017, and I was living in uh, Temple City with my my friend JT, who was doing a postdoc with our um, my doctor father. His name is Oliver Crisp. So uh, basically, I was really impressed with Catholic theology, and I was convinced that it had answers to a lot of questions. And I was um, ready to pull the trigger on becoming a Catholic. But then I decided against it. Um, I determined that I actually I don't want to do this. I don't think this would be the right thing for me to do. Um, and especially as I began working on my dissertation in 2019 um, and 2020, uh, I began to see that my own philosophical predilections and my preferences for phenomenology um, militated against the Catholic theological system in various ways. And since then, since the writing of my dissertation until the present day, so it's been a couple of years now, um, I've been working out piece by piece exactly where the problems lie. Uh, and um, I came to the conclusion that actually Roman Catholic theology is uh, epistemically very seriously compromised. I think that it, it does not function uh, appropriately. I don't think that it is, uh, how to put it? I think that it basically suffers from various problems of rationality and um, epistemic problems. Uh, so I became convinced against it. And um, I wanted to start talking with people about this issue of Protestantism versus Roman Catholicism and uh, Eastern Orthodoxy, because I saw that very many people were sort of, you know, swimming the Tiber or swimming the Bos Bosphorus, very ardently and zealously becoming Roman Catholic after what I thought were rather minimal, you know, periods of, of uh, investigation and research. I think, in fact, that the the common arguments that convince people to become Roman Catholic are not very good at all. Um, and I think that the evidence is not actually there for Roman Catholicism. Uh, but I see very many people doing it. I see a lot of people who leave their Protestant background, stop going to church, suddenly alienate themselves from all their friends and their families, and they become convinced that it's God will, God's will for them to be Roman Catholics. Well, I don't agree, uh, but I also saw that there weren't enough Protestant voices out there on the internet speaking to these people. Um, I saw that there weren't enough people uh, making arguments and making them publicly and in an accessible manner uh, as to the conclusion, why should people not be Roman Catholic or why should you remain Protestant? And even the people who were doing this, a lot of times just gave straw man arguments that were very easily uh, refuted by Catholic apologists. So basically what I, why I got into this discussion and why I'm involved in it is because I was also on that track at one point of becoming a Roman Catholic, and I decided that it's not the right thing for me to do. I thought that it would actually be the wrong thing for me to do. Um, I do not think that there are good reasons to become Roman Catholic. I think Roman Catholic theology operates in a way that is, I think, epistemically compromised, and we can talk more about that later. Um, and I think actually it's more important that people remain Protestant. Uh, so 
I wanted to get this out there. I wanted to tell people what I think. I wanted to share my own uh, conclusions with other people and to give people another side because I saw that the, the Roman Catholics and the Eastern Orthodox have not quite a monopoly, but they certainly control much of the market on YouTube and under other internet sources. And there weren't very many distinctly Protestant um, channels and, and um, sources out there that were giving strong enough counter arguments. So that's what I'm trying to do, I suppose. That's, that's, you know, that's a long answer to a short question, but that's why I got involved in this discussion. Hey, if your answers were all as long as my questions, we would be done far too soon. <laughs> so no worries about that at all. And I really appreciate that what that need that you identified because I, i've definitely seen that though there are tons of protestant youtubers out there doing great work making bible study videos and things like that there aren't a ton in this specific odd corner of the internet that we both inhabit where uh, there's kind of like ecumenical dialogue going on and people are considering uh, conversion to roman catholicism or eastern orthodoxy so i, I appreciate your voice in these and I, I really do think you bring a unique perspective to this which is again why i was excited to have you on the channel i'm really excited to dive into some of your specific critiques on kind of the epistemic underpinnings of roman catholicism and we will get there for everyone who is watching don't worry we will be there soon enough but i, I do want to slow down a bit because i think you hit on some important things that I think are just good for people to hear who watch this channel. Specifically that idea of how fast so many people are swimming the Tiber or the Bosphorus, as they say. I've only been making these videos for a little over a year. And in that time, I can think of specific individuals, multiple, who have converted and then switched back to Protestantism or to Eastern Orthodoxy or to whatever multiple times in that year. I've also had people message me like, how could you look at these things for more than two months and not be Orthodox, not be Catholic, etc.? And just the, the sheer complexity of some of these issues is, is what I try to bring people back to occasionally to say like, you're making huge decisions. Let's make sure we make these decisions wisely and thoughtfully with kind of respect given to the gravity of the questions. And so I'm curious what that journey was like for you. I mean, you were in RCIA, you were very close. And then you mentioned that you kind of had this philosophical preference for phenomenology, which is seems like where it started, but then that morphed into a more strong conviction that actually remaining Protestant wasn't just a good thing to do, but was actually the right thing to do and something you should encourage other people to do. What was that like for you? How, how did that journey impact your faith? And maybe what, what advice would you give for people who are on that road and feel that need to, to convert like right now based on the yeah. arguments that they've heard? Well, the journey actually for me was a lot longer. I, I said that I started getting into Catholic theology around the year 2016, 2017, but actually my, my um, flirtations with Roman Catholicism and with Eastern Orthodoxy be began a lot before that. Uh, my family are Romanians from Romania, and the majority religion in Romania, of course, is Eastern Orthodoxy. Uh, now, my family, my extended family is sort of split down the middle. Half of us are Pentecostals, uh, which are a, a, a religious minority in Romania, and half of us are Eastern Orthodox. And my parents specifically are Pentecostals. So um, I was raised in the Romanian Pentecostal church, uh, which in various respects is, is different from the kind of um, what, you, what you might call excesses of, of uh, certain quarters of American Pentecostalism. Romanians, I think, are just not the sorts of persons who can you know, run, around in the, <laughs> run around in the church and throw themselves on the ground and wave flags and stuff. I don't think Romanians are structurally capable of that sort of thing. Um, but Romanian Pentecostalism is the, the religion that I grew up in. Um, and for a long time, I, I started studying theology seriously when I was about 16 years old. So this was in 2006. Um, and for as long as I had been doing that, I always felt an attraction towards Eastern Orthodoxy. I always felt that there was something attractive to me about the Eastern Orthodox ethos. Um, I, you know, for example, when I was an undergrad at, at the university at ASU at Arizona State, I would have a copy of the sayings of the Desert Fathers with me. Uh, and I would read it, you know, as I would go from my Latin class to my philosophy class or whatever. I would be reading it constantly as I would walk around. Um, you know, I really wanted to embody that monastic uh, way of life. I was a vegetarian for a long time because I thought that it would be a more disciplined lifestyle for me to live. Um, I would wake up at 530 in the morning, even if I didn't need to, just so that I could say that I, say that I had a structured and a disciplined life as a way of sort of, you know, putting order on myself, I suppose. 
Um, and I've always felt this, like I said, this, what we can call a sort of an aesthetic attraction to the, the, the Orthodox ethos. You know, I would listen to the divine liturgy in my car. I would listen to choral Orthodox music and so on. And I really liked all that. Um, but I never, I don't know why I, I, it was with Roman Catholicism specifically that I, that I went and actually, you know, was in the process of converting by going to RCIA. Now, why did I do it then? Uh, you know, 10 years later, after I had been flirting with orthodoxy constantly uh, for 10 years or so, I suppose I was thinking that Roman Catholicism had a more clear cut dogmatic system than Eastern Orthodoxy did. It was, you know, it, it had easy sources that you could point to um, where you could find out, okay, what is the Roman Catholic position on X? Uh, and so I, I like that about it. Um, and I actually happen to think that for a lot of people, the attraction of Roman Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy less so, but especially Roman Catholicism, is precisely how easy it is as a theological system to find, you know, where the boundaries are. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church has a pretty well-functioning bureaucracy that determines, you know, what are the appropriate boundaries of theological investigation? What does the church believe? What does it not believe? What's permitted? What is not permitted? Um, and I think for a lot of people, the difficulty of coming to a firm conclusion in matters of theology is what motivates them towards a system like that, because the answers are given to you very easily. You know, whatever is infallibly declared by the Pope, there you have it. That's what we have to believe. Um, you know, whatever is declared by an ecumenical council, there you have it. That's what we have to believe. Whatever, you know, is basically agreed upon as essential to the faith by all bishops in communion with each other and with the Bishop of Rome uh, throughout all of church history, there you have it. That's what we have to believe. And everything else, you can talk about it. And then there's also the fact that Roman Catholicism has produced massive theological systems, like, for example, Thomism, um, that, you know, it's this you know, wide, comprehensive, expansive vision of reality, and there's a Thomist position on more or less everything. So I think a lot of people are attracted to Roman Catholicism because it does sort of make the theological task easier. Uh, and I was certainly attracted to it for that reason. Um, but my, my fascinations with non-Protestant quarters of Christianity didn't begin in 2016. Like I said, it was a 10-year process spanning back to when I was 16 and in high school. Uh, and I felt this sort of weird fascination and attraction with Eastern Orthodoxy, even though the family that I had grown up in was uh, Pentecostal. Now, what advice would I give to people who are themselves on this journey? Um, the one thing that I would give them is, the one piece of advice that I would give to them is not to inundate themselves with strictly Roman Catholic or strictly Eastern Orthodox sources. Um, it is extremely easy when you're attracted to a theological system when you see that it solves a problem that you have, you know, from your own system, to just go dive in head first. And because it managed to solve one problem for you, therefore all the problems are solved. You just accept everything that it says. You only read Roman Catholic sources. You only talk to other Roman Catholics. Um, you slowly alienate yourselves from other, you know, spheres of influence, other, other persons of different convictions that might have something to say to you about these issues. Uh, you stop reading Protestant theology. Um, one thing that's noteworthy is that many people who convert to Roman Catholicism from Protestantism have not even read very much Protestant theology. Maybe they've read, you know, commentaries by John MacArthur or D.A. Carson or whatever, and they have a kind of a vague familiarity with the, the celebrity figures in the, you know, American Reformed evangelical circles. But they have little to no awareness of historic Protestant theology. That, incidentally, is one reason why I like um, our friend Gavin Ortland's channel, because uh, he also will make this point. A lot of people are not familiar with historic Baptist theology or historic Protestant theology more generally. Um, they're not aware actually that there is a rich Protestant theological tradition, which in many ways is consonant and resonates with uh, some of the things that they might like about Roman Catholicism or Eastern Orthodoxy also. Um, one way of stating this point is that Protestantism also has a Catholic with a lowercase c uh, universal aspect to it. Uh, so but a lot of people don't know this, right? They just grow up in an American, um, you know, evangelical mega church with, you know, fog machines and a rock concert every Sunday. Um, and then they, they are suddenly introduced to the totally foreign world of Roman Catholicism or Eastern Orthodoxy. They like it. And then suddenly they throw away everything that they had in their past because all that's garbage. Now I have to do this new thing. Um, my advice to those persons would be to slow down, to pump the brakes. Um, and to consider very carefully what you're doing, because it's one thing to just read a bunch of Roman Catholic theology, 
but it's another thing also to familiarize yourself with Protestant theology and to be familiar with the reasons that Protestants give for remaining Protestant or, you know, historically that Protestants have given for being Protestant rather than Eastern Orthodox or Roman Catholic. Um, there's that proverb, it's in chapter 18, I think it's verse 17, right? Somebody comes and states his case and everything sounds great, but then somebody else comes and, and examines him and then suddenly the truth is not so clear. That's the Stephen Nemish paraphrase. That's how these things are in theology. Everything in theology sounds good when you're hearing it for the first time. But then when you hear the counter argument, suddenly you're not so convinced. Um, and it's actually very difficult. You, just belonging to a tradition that gives you all the answers to those questions, that doesn't mean that you have the right answers. It just means that you have a system that can sort of set the boundaries for you. But it doesn't mean that you're actually um, believing true things. Uh, so I would say that the efficiency of the Roman Catholic bureaucratic system for establishing the boundaries of theology is one thing, and the actual truth of its theological opinions is something else. And it's not obvious for very many people that the things that Roman Catholic uh, theology or Eastern Orthodox theology says uh, are true. So the one thing that I would recommend for people is that they not just jump headfirst into converting to Roman Catholicism or Eastern Orthodoxy, but that they also, you know, engage in the necessary research to make sure that they're not giving up on something. Um, they should familiarize themselves with Protestant theology alongside Roman Catholicism or, or Eastern Orthodoxy. And if they're going to read the best of Eastern Orthodoxy or the best of Roman Catholicism, they should also make an effort to read the best of uh, classic Protestant theology, for example, the reformers um, and, you know, all the various important figures who, who came up after them. Uh, so that would be one thing that I would say in response to the person who, you know, is like super zealous about converting to Catholicism and, you know, he's, he's all caught up in it. Uh, I would say that before you get taken away by the waves, make sure that you are, you know, making a rational decision and that you're not just um, bedazzled by a theological system where all the pieces fit together very nicely. It's another question whether that system is true. Um, and just because you have a coherent system of ideas, it doesn't follow that they correspond to reality. I think the establishing that they do correspond to reality is much harder to do. Um, and what I've tried to show on my channels, on my YouTube, uh, on my videos, on my YouTube channel, and also in my published uh, works and papers and so on, is that it's not actually obvious that the things that Roman Catholicism says uh, are in fact true. Now you asked me, how did this journey affect my own theological convictions? It's interesting because in many ways, um, I, you, you were talking about earlier, uh, people who are experiencing sort of ecclesial homelessness. I have felt like that for 15 years, basically, uh, for as long as I've been studying theology, I felt like I've been in ecclesial no man's land. I feel like I don't belong anywhere. Um, for a while, this bothered me. And I started to think, well, maybe I should go to a different kind of church. Maybe I should belong to a different tradition so that I can just belong somewhere. I can be somewhere um, and fit in with everyone else. But I think that in the way that I've developed as a person, I actually am not bothered by this anymore. I have assumed the responsibility and the calling of being a person who thinks for himself. And it's no longer a bother to me that I don't agree with everybody on everything. Um, I, there does not exist, you know, an extant... Uh, Christian theological tradition where I'm going to agree with everything. And I've just reconciled myself to that. That's just the way things are. Um, that's the way I am. Sometimes I wonder to myself, you know, whether my my calling might not be precisely to, you know, try to show where the cracks are in, in the edifice and maybe to make something new. There were, I remember when I was in seminary, I got my master's degree um, at Fuller. I got an MDiv. I read a book in my missions class or my missions history class about certain figures in Africa or in Asia who basically belonged to no church and they just considered themselves God's messengers. And they just went around preaching to Christians of all different denominations. And it didn't matter to them whether they went to Protestants or Roman Catholics, they didn't belong to any particular church. They just went around, they were convinced that their task is to preach the gospel uh, because they didn't, whatever for whatever reason, they didn't feel that they belonged anywhere. Now, I don't call myself an apostle. I don't know that I'm sent by God to do this per se, but that's a lot of, that's, that's how I feel. It seems to me that um, I can have a conversation with anybody. I can, I can agree with a Christian from any tradition and I can disagree with a Christian from any tradition. I don't feel that I belong anywhere in particular. Um, so I just view my, my work as a theologian as the effort to um, call people back to what is true and to try to get a vision of the truth independently of any particular tradition um, and independently of any concern to agree or to disagree with particular people. To me, it's all the same whether I people agree with me or disagree with me. 
my work as a theologian is aimed at getting what, at what is true. And it's possible that there's some truth that everybody's missing, just as it's possible that there's a truth that everybody agrees on. Um, so that's, that's how I feel. I've, I've reconciled myself to the fact that I'm a sort of a permanent inhabitant of, of ecclesial no man's land. I've, I've, been a, I've been ecclesially homeless for a long time, um, not in the sense that I don't go to church, but in the sense that I don't feel that I belong anywhere, uh, you know, unreservedly or unqualifiedly. And that's just how I am. Um, if some other people feel like that, you know, whatever. That doesn't mean you have to throw yourself into the arms of Holy Mother Church, so to speak, uh, just because you don't like not belonging somewhere. Maybe that's maybe that's just the way things are. Maybe you just can't belong somewhere because not everybody, you know, there's no one particular party that has the whole truth. Maybe that's just how things are. Um, and for what it's worth, a lot of my friends who are academic theologians also have that feeling. They also feel that they don't belong anywhere. Um, so I'm not alone in this. There are a lot of academic theologians who feel that they cannot sign on to any particular tradition uh, they can't belong wholeheartedly to any particular ecclesial body, but they do attend church and they just, you know, they just live with it because that's just what it is to think for yourself. It means that inevitably you're going to disagree with people. Um, so that's another, again, another long answer to a, a relatively short question. Well, in fairness, I think I packed like three questions into that short question. You did a great job of keeping track of all of those and answering them in turn. So I appreciate that. That's not easy to do. I really love a lot of the things that you said in there, especially that call and, and the shout out to uh, Dr. Ortland for, for going back to the best of Protestant sources. I, I've seen so many people that they get kind of fascinated with Catholic or Orthodox theology, and I can recognize this in my own life. I think my journey would be a lot different if I wasn't attending a Protestant school where part of my kind of job as a student is to read some of these great sources. And I remember going through a, a Calvin class with a, a phenomenal professor and then doing a lot of work on Torrance and thinking, if I hadn't gotten to engage with these just brilliant Protestant thinkers who I don't agree with on everything, but who are genuinely brilliant, this probably would have felt a lot different for me. It probably would have been more overwhelming or I, I'd be more skewed in one direction. But but mm. I think, you know, in fairness, we want to we want to see the best of all of these. And if you only ever read one side and you end up on that side, I don't, I don't think it's a whole lot of surprise and it's probably not fair to pit someone like john MacArthur against thomas aquinas I, i'm not right, trying of to course. say anything about john MacArthur. i'll let people make their opinions um, but aquinas has you know withstood the test of time and uh, whether MacArthur will i suppose i'll leave to the audience i, I do want to hit on one thing though because i suppose i've been doing these conversations long enough or reading the comments long enough to to know one response that i think is going to come from what you just said and I, I want to pitch it to you because I know you're passionate about giving maybe better answers than are often given to kind of popular level apologetic uh, refutations, if you will, or attempted refutations of Protestantism. And I, I can already hear people, you know, clicking on the keys to say, wait a second. So this journey of kind of no man's land aren't you becoming your own pope, Dr. Nemesh? And I'm sure you get that comment in your work that Protestantism leads to everyone being their own pope and becoming their own infallible uh, spokesman for, for the church. Rather than just having one, Protestantism makes everyone a pope, which has been levied since Martin Luther. How, how yeah. would you respond to that particular uh, line of thought? It's no secret that today, perhaps more than ever, people are struggling with their mental health. I think if I asked you all to virtually raise your hand and said, hey, are you currently struggling? Have you ever, do you consistently struggle with mental health, be it anxiety, depression, or whatever? I think many of us, myself included, would raise our hand and say, yeah, like things get hard sometimes, and sometimes it feels like more than we can handle the problem is, despite facing these difficult circumstances and dealing with these mental health crises at times, so few of us end up actually getting the help that we need. It might be because it can take so long to get into a counselor or therapist or you think it's going to be too much, or maybe there's this thought in the back of your head that Christians aren't allowed to have mental health problems. Does that mean there's something wrong with me? 
Well, from the beginning of my channel, far before it had any type of reach or influence, I have wanted to help do my part to help end that stigma. That's why one of my first videos I ever made was titled, You Can Have Jesus and a Therapist Too. Hoping that that would give people the permission to go out and get the help they need without being worried about these shameful stigmas that people have attached to it. Well, now I am so excited to be partnering with Faithful Counseling, who is who are leading the charge in helping people get the help they need. Rather than having to wait months to get into a counselor, if you sign up for Faithful Counseling, you can be paired with a counselor in 24 hours or less. I don't know if you've ever attempted to do something like this through traditional avenues, but if you have, you know just how crazy it is to be able to pair up with someone that quickly. All of their counselors are licensed and have over 3,000 hours of experience. You can connect with them in flexible ways. You can do uh, video sessions, phone calls, uh, private messaging. It is really fantastic. They even have a live chat. It is such an amazing service. I'm so excited to be partnering with them, and I'd really encourage you to check them out. by going to faithfulcounseling.com slash gospel simplicity. If you do so, you'll get 10% off your first month, and I think it will be really, really helpful for you. Now, I do want to say that this isn't a crisis line, and if you are experiencing suicidal thoughts or ideation, I would encourage you so, so much to not go through this alone, but to reach out to a crisis line. I'll put one on the screen here. But if you are looking for mental health help, I think Faithful Counseling could be great for you. They will connect you with a Christian counselor, and I know people come to my channel from a variety of backgrounds. So if you want one specifically from your Christian denomination, they will work with you to try to make that happen so that you can get Christian mental health help. I think it's going to be fantastic for you. I can't wait for you to check it out. Again, that's faithfulcounseling.com slash gospel simplicity. You get 10% off your first month. After that, it'll be $260 per month, but there is financial aid available for those who qualify. Once again, guys, don't hesitate to get the help you need. Faithfulcounseling.com slash gospel simplicity. Well, I would say that everybody is always already and inevitably uh, his or her own pope because nobody can think for you. You have to think for yourself. Now, you can come to the decision that you should subject your judgment to whatever somebody else says. That's true. That's fair. That's a decision that you can make. But it is nevertheless you who have made that decision. So any authority that that person has for you uh, is an authority that you're willing to grant them. Right. And for whatever reason, you came to the conclusion that this person thinks better about the topic than I do. So I'm going to submit to his judgment. Now, if I think that I can think better than that person, that is equally a decision of my own. But you you have still made a decision for yourself. You have still decided for yourself uh, that it would be better for you to submit your judgment to this person's opinion rather than to think for yourself. Um, to me, it seems to me that this is just the way things are. All right. You can you know, if we want to talk phenomenology and we can reference a little bit of Heidegger here. The average person lives inauthentically. That means that they just go along with whatever everybody else is saying and doing and thinking. They don't think for themselves. Um, they, uh, they simply go along with the, the flow of the crowd. Um, living authentically means making a decision for yourself about how to live. Now, maybe you come to the decision that the way you were living before is, in fact, the right way to live. But there's a world of a difference between doing it unthinkingly and doing it thinkingly. Adopting a way of life because you're convinced that it's best or adopting a way of a life simply because of external forces somehow molding you in that direction. Um, it seems to me that even persons who convert to Catholicism are doing so because they are convinced for themselves. They came to the conclusion themselves that this would be the right thing to do. Um, and even if, you know, they, they do so because of the testimony of the church, so to speak, on behalf of itself, it's still true that you have come to accept this testimony as true. Uh, so I think that this idea about everybody be being his own pope, everybody is already his own pope. Nobody can think for you. You have to think for yourself. Um, and you can use your power of thought to come to the conclusion that you should become Roman Catholic, or you can use your power of thought to come to the conclusion that you should remain a Protestant, but it is nevertheless you who are thinking. So all I am doing in, 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 in this entire, you know, life of a theologian that I've taken up for myself now, uh, all that I'm doing is in a self-aware, in a thinking conscious manner, uh, determining what I believe and what I think is true and uh, committing to it. Uh, now, people who convert to Roman Catholicism are still doing exactly that. It's just that they come to different conclusions than me. So I am no more my own pope than they are. If I'm my own pope for thinking for myself, then they also are their own popes for 
thinking for themselves that it would be better for them to become Roman Catholic. It's, it's still a decision that you come to on your own, uh, exercising your own reason. I, I've always thought along pretty similar lines. There was a period of time where I was getting a lot of angry emails from certain people about how dare I consider myself worthy to judge the Catholic Church. I just need to submit to it. But I was always struck by the fact that, but you're still asking me to judge the Catholic Church. You're just asking me to judge that it's correct and then submit to it. Unless, because I don't think anyone sees submission in and of itself as it's a positive thing. Submission sin to an authority, specifically religiously, I think only is admirable judging that that person actually has the authority and it would be a good person to submit to. So I've always find it, found it to be kind of an odd line of thought. I, I can see mm. maybe down the line arguments about kind of the splintering that it could cause, and, and that's fair and that's a separate subject. But, but I think this specific line of everyone becoming their own pope might be something that needs to be put to rest. Uh, we'll, we'll let uh, people share what they think about that, I'm sure, in the comments. But, but I appreciate you answering that. Is there something you want to say there? Yeah, I did want to add just a small thing, because you mentioned uh, just now this idea of splintering. Uh, and people complain uh, that the Protestant Reformation and the, the, you know, sort of the evacuation of ecclesial authority as leading to the splintering. I actually think that Catholicism itself is to uh, is to blame for the splintering. And I will explain why. This is something that I'm sure we'll get into also later. But I think actually that as the, the so-called Catholic, not Roman Catholic, but lowercase c Catholic theological tradition develops in history, um, it comes to understand uh, Christian faith as a matter of assenting to per specific and very well formulated doctrinal ideas. Um, and the, the prime example of this is the so-called Athanasian Creed. Whoever would be saved before everything else, he must hold the Catholic faith. And what is that Catholic faith? Well, the Creed elaborates it basically as a series of statements about the consubstantiality of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and about the two natures of Christ. Okay, so the Catholic faith is a very specific set of doctrines uh, about who God is in himself and how the two natures of Christ relate to each other. Uh, and uh, unless a person holds to these things firmly and to the end, he will not be saved. He cannot be saved, says the creed. So already before the Protestant Reformation ever became a reality, there had been this mindset inculcated in, the, in, in Christian people that being a Christian is about believing very specific things. Um, and disagreement about these very specific things is tantamount with abandoning the Catholic faith and being outside the church. Now, what happens when later on in history, already this approach to religious faith has been adopted and it's basically become worldwide. Uh, what happens when later people come to find, uh, there are fine points of disagreement among themselves about whatever it is that they take to be important. Well, then naturally they're going to break into a bunch of different churches because they've been taught for years and years that in order to be a part of the church, you have to agree to very specific doctrinal formula. You cannot have differences of opinion. You have to have very precisely formulated beliefs. And if you don't have that, then you're wishy-washy. And if you disagree with our formulations, then you're outside of the church. So it's Catholicism itself, not Roman Catholicism, but this Catholic theological tradition that has created a particular sort of religious mindset that has formed Christians uh, to be the sorts of persons that can no longer live with each other if they disagree. Uh, they have learned that Either we live together because we all agree on very specific formulas uh, or else you're a heretic and you're on the outside and our, we are going to separate from you. So this mentality, this particular sectarian attitude already existed in the Catholic theological tradition prior to the Reformation. It's just that in the Reformation, suddenly, you know, these groups that splintered off didn't die out and they weren't burned at the stake. They had, you know, for the first time, the ability to sort of maintain themselves and to live autonomously and to develop, you know, uh, and even to find new lands in America and so on. So the historical situation was slightly different in the Reformation, which allowed for these splinter groups to survive and to have a sort of inertia. Um, but the mentality that produces splinter groups in the first place already existed in the Catholic theological tradition much earlier than the Reformation. So I would say that it is not the Protestants who are to blame for splintering. It is the Catholic theological tradition that preceded the Reformation by hundreds of years uh, that is to blame for the mentality, for forming Christians in such a way that they simply can't get together, they can't live together unless they agree on very precise formulas. I think that's a really fascinating diagnosis there, and I think it gets at something that is often overlooked, and I did have one guest come on the channel once, uh, Dr. David Burkhott, and we talked about 
for him when he looked at the early church, he really focused on on the lifestyle and he saw that as kind of lacking and then this kind of attitude of making the the boundaries kind of smaller and smaller and smaller, um, which was an interesting conversation. And I imagine there there's some connections here. I, I want to dive into this because I think this is going to kind of get towards a lot of the meat of this conversation and what you see as the potential future of Protestant theology, which I believe is at least in part marked by a turn away from that specific way of defining what it means to be Christian. But I'm going to let you define all of that. I think just a, maybe a little preamble to all of that mm -hmm. uh, that will be helpful is we've thrown out this multisyllabic word a few times, phenomenology, which mm -hmm. people might not be super familiar with. I, my channel attracts people kind of from across the spectrum. I haven't done a ton of philosophies specifically, or at least um, advertised as such on this channel. So I think it might be helpful for people to just have like a really basic what is phenomenology before we get to in the weeds? Sure. Um, so I, there are a few things I would want to say by way of preface. The first thing is that I have a paper forthcoming this year uh, in the Journal of Analytic Theology called Can Analytic Theology Be Phenomenological? Um, and the, the, that's the title of the paper. That's the premise. Basically, I'm arguing not only that it can, but that it should. And in that paper, I provide a very succinct summary of what phenomenology is uh, and whether or not analytic theology can take a phenomenological turn. Um, so be on the lookout for that. That should be coming up probably in August or September, but that will be a, a, a nice go-to reference for talking about this question of what is phenomenology. Um, now, in that paper, I mention that it's not easy to define phenomenology. Um, there are differences among phenomenologists. So phenomenology sort of really became a, a, a particular movement within philosophy with Edmund Husserl at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, he had various famous students, the most famous of which, which was uh, Martin Heidegger, but also people like um, Edith Stein, Dietrich von Hildebrand, and others, uh, Max Scheler, um, Roman Ingarden, and, and other figures. Um, and basically, after you get from Husserl to Heidegger, and then from Heidegger to all these other figures, uh, really the shape of phenomenology changes. So some people say that phenomenology you know, was born and died with Husserl. Um, other people are more confident that actually there is a kind of a, a single thread that connects Husserl to all the later people who take the title of phenomenologists. Um, basically, phenomenology, you know, we, can, we can follow the definition of Robert Sokolowski. He says that phenomenology is the study of human experience and of the way things present themselves to us in and through such experience. Um, and in my own definition, I would say that phenomenology is a particular school of philosophy which engages in its analyses by means of the careful description of experience. Uh, so phenomenology is a school of philosophy that performs its tasks uh, through the very careful descriptive analysis of experience. So for the phenomenologist, the way we do ph philosophy is by describing experience. Now, that does not mean... Uh, describing particular experiences, like for example, the the um, you know the the water that I'm drinking is very refreshing. It's it's not about just describing your first person experiences. Actually, phenomenology is about finding essential structures of experience uh, that are going to be um, necessarily true, that are going to be um, valid for all experiences of a certain sort. Uh, so, for example, if you wanted to do a phenomenology of reading, uh, you would not just talk about what it's like for you to read. You would talk about what it is to read just in general, what is necessary to read, what are the preconditions of reading, what does reading mean, what is the goal of reading, and you would answer all these questions through the careful description and analysis of our own experience of reading. Um, if you wanted to do a phenomenology of love, you would not just be describing what it's like for you to love. You would be asking the question, what is it essentially to love? And you would be answering that question through the careful analysis of the experience of loving. You would ask yourself, what is it exactly that makes this experience to be an experience of love? What, if I take it away, would compromise it so that it's no longer love but something else? Uh, what is the goal? What am I going after when I, when I love? Um, what makes it possible for me to love? And so on. So phenomenology is a method for philosophy that has a certain motto. This motto comes back, goes back to uh, Edmund Husserl, um, and he has this line in one of his books called Logical Investigations, where he says... Uh, we cannot be satisfied with mere words. We have to go back to the things themselves. So this is sort of the motto that encapsulates and summarizes the phenomenological method. If you want to study something, 
You cannot just spend all your time thinking about your concept of that thing or about how we use the words or about what other people have said about the thing. You have to go to the thing itself. Um, and going to the thing itself means um, describing as far as is possible the way that that thing discloses itself in experience because experience is how things are put into relation with each other. For example, I am able to be related to you now because of experience. If I were totally unconscious, and if I couldn't see, if I couldn't hear, if I couldn't do anything, I could not be related to you, right? If you were totally unconscious, then you could not be related to me. So experience, consciousness, is how we are related to things. Um, and things show themselves, things present themselves to us in experience as they are. Here's another important principle of phenomenology. There is no, uh, separation. There's no rupture between appearance and being. Things are as they appear and things appear as they are. Uh, the way things are is the way that they appear and the way things appear is the way that they are. So the reason why phenomenology functions as a method is because it takes for granted that when we experience things, we are experiencing them as they are. Um, so I know that this is a long answer and you asked for a short one, but again, to summarize, basically phenomenology is a method for philosophy uh, that proceeds by way of the careful analytic description of experience. If I'm doing a phenomenology of X, then I am asking the question, uh, what is X? And I answer that question by describing as far as is possible, the essential structures of X as it is disclosed in experience. So I, I turn to the experience of X in order to um, answer the question of what X is. Uh, so the answer to the question, what X is, is going to be uh, is going to be a description of how X is experienced, and especially the essential structures of the experience of X. All right, I think that's really helpful for people, and I think they'll see more as we go through specifically applying this to theology. I think it might be helpful here to turn to a syllogism, or uh, I guess a series of premises um, and, that you give and. Against Infallibility in Theology, which is an article that you've written, and it follows as such. One should only speak about things with as much confidence as one's access to the facts permit. But our access to the things of theology, as to all things in the world, is only ever fallible and subject to revision. Therefore, we should renounce the pretense of infallibility in theology. Now, mm -hmm. when I say that, when we kind of talk about taking infallibility out of theology, I think that's going to sound pretty... Uh, surprising to some people, at least, specifically to my Roman Catholic viewers um, and probably to my Eastern Orthodox viewers and maybe to everyone. We'll see how it goes over. <laughs> but the reason I wanted to pull this up now is that actually I think the kind of methodological um, preference for phenomenology, that might not be a, the right way of putting it, but, but phenomenology certainly underpins that. And this might be a way of illustrating that. So what what is it about phenomenology that's going to change how we do theology such that we might consider something like infallibility, maybe not a helpful category anymore? Sure. Um, well, so if you accept the premise, the phenomenological premise that um, our knowledge of a thing has to proceed as far as is possible from the self-disclosure of that thing and experience. If you pay close attention to actually what happens when we experience things, you're going to see that uh, our knowledge of things is going to be fallible. There's always going to be the possibility that the conclusions that we come to now will be undermined in the future. And let me give two reasons for why that is. Uh, in, in that paper, I essentially give one reason, but I, I can give two here now. Uh, the first reason is this. In any experience that we have, anytime we are presented with an object, we have to make an interpretive choice between saying this thing is an X or this thing presently resembles, but is not in fact an X. And I will give an example. Suppose I see someone in a crowd and it looks like my friend JT, okay? In that moment, I can choose between saying that is JT or that person only presently resembles, but is not in fact JT, okay? Suppose I go for the, the, suppose I go for the interpretation that it is JT. Now the crowd sort of dissipates and I can see the person more clearly. Uh, and then I come to the conclusion, oh, this is not JT because of how I see the person then, right? So my earlier, uh, um, my earlier d uh, interpretation of my experience of him was undermined by my present one, okay? So the way that he appeared to me then allowed the interpretation that it's JT. The way that he appears to me now seems to not allow 
that it that is JT. Now it seems to only allow the interpretation that it isn't him. Uh, so anytime we are um, anytime we experience anything whatsoever, we're put in the position of choosing between one of two possible interpretations. This thing is an X or this thing only resembles, but is not in fact an X. And even if we make one or the other interpretation, future experiences can undermine that. Now notice there's also this possibility, even in that second experience, all right, I'm inclined to say this is no longer JT. But in fact, it could actually be JT. It's just now it doesn't look like him. Uh, maybe something about him has changed. Maybe he looks different now because uh, something has happened in the meantime. Um, so there are all these factors, right? In any one experience, we are not given the whole story of reality. Any one experience is just going to be singular. It's going to be the way things look in, that, uh, in those circumstances in which I find them. And in every such experience, I can always say this thing is an X or this thing only resembles, but is not presently an X. Um, and even if I find, you know, later, uh, later experiences seemingly confirm my previous interpretation. Well, even then I'm in the position of choosing between two interpretations. I can say that this thing is an X and all these experiences prove it. Or I can say that, no, this thing is not in fact an X. It's just that it has you know, persistently and continuously resembled an X until now, but possibly future uh, experiences will disconfirm this. So, you know, th this is the, this is just the way things are. This is just the fact that we never in any one experience get complete and total access to what a thing is. All of our experiences of things are partial. They're perspectival. They're given a certain uh, background. Um, and it's always possible that our present grasp of things will be undermined by something in the future. Uh, now, people might find this unthinkable, but this sort of thing happens in history all the time. Uh, think, for example, of something that we think is obvious, but for the, I think, the vast majority of human history was not obvious. The fact that the sun revolves around the earth, right? People in the past thought that the sun revolved around the earth. Now, why did they think that? Because when you go outside, the earth seems to be standing still, whereas the sun moves around the sky. So it looks like the sun revolves around the earth. Now, later come Galileo and Copernicus, and they prove that, in fact, the Earth revolves around the sun. Uh, and for us, this is obvious. But for the vast majority of people throughout history, this would not have been obvious. This would have been actually very counterintuitive. Um, so it's possible that very many people, you know, one appearance seems to support an interpretation. And then later appearances will or later experiences will disconfirm that prior interpretation. Um, and the later opinion becomes obvious for subsequent generations, even though it would have been unthinkable for previous generations. So the, these sorts of things happen all the time in, in, in history. You know, everybody can be wrong about something. And it, all it takes is one person to come along and to be able to see things clearly and to explain it to everyone. And then suddenly a new, a new opinion t gets taken for granted. Um, so one reason why we should, we, we should renounce the pretense to infallibility is the fact that we never have the complete picture of things. All we have are a sum of experiences, a sum of appearances uh, that we interpret one way, but that could easily be interpreted in the opposite way. We take all of our experiences together and we say, okay, reality is so-and-so. Uh, but we could also just as well say, no, reality is not so-and-so. It just has looked this way until now. And possibly future uh, experiences will disconfirm that. That's one reason. The second reason why we should renounce the pretense to infallibility is because when we experience things, we are also simultaneously experiencing ourself, ourselves. And I'll give you this example. Uh, right now, as I look around my room, uh, I have a fish tank over there in that corner of the room. You can't see it, but I can. Now, that fish tank uh, appears to be, you know, cubic. Uh, there's a fish inside of it. The water is flowing. The light is turned on. All those are qualities that belong to the fish tank, okay? As far as those qualities are concerned, that's the fish tank that I'm seeing. But notice, the fish tank also looks blurry to me. Why does it look blurry to me? Not because the fish tank is blurry, but because I don't have glasses on. My eyesight is bad, right? So I am not only seeing the fish tank, I'm also simultaneously experiencing myself. And it's my sense of sight that allows me to see the fish tank in the way that I do. If I had, for example, the, uh, if I were colorblind, the items in the fish tank would look different. If I couldn't see color at all, it would look different to me. Uh, if I had the sense of, you know, if I had the eyesight of another kind of animal, say of a, a hawk or a cat or a dog, then again, the fish tank would look very differently to me. If I could see UV rays uh, or if I could see heat, you know, like the predator or whatever, the fish tank would look differently to me than it does now. So I don't only just experience the fish tank. I'm also experiencing myself, particularly my powers of perception, which make me capable of uh, encountering the fish tank. Furthermore, uh, there's also the fact that I experience things uh, 
as my way of thinking allows me to do so. So for example, right now I am talking to you by means of this computer, and there's nothing unfamiliar to me about this. This is totally normal. But if you were to take my great grandmother from Romania who died you know, before any of this stuff were invented, and if she were to come here, she would not understand what's happening. She would just see a bunch of stuff here, and it would take a long time uh, for her to be able to see in this setup what I see. It would take a long time for her to be able to experience it the way that I do, because it, it would be totally unfamiliar to her. So also, that fish tank there, there's no surprise to me that there's a fish tank there because I remember buying it. Suppose I never remembered buying it. Suppose somebody hit my, you know, hit me in the head and I lost all memory of owning a fish tank. And then I walk into the room and I see it there. I, it's going to be a very different experience to me, given the way that I think about it, because I'm not expecting it there and because it's a surprise. So uh, these examples show that whenever we experience things in the world, we are not just getting a direct vision of things exactly as they are. We see things as they are, but we are also experiencing things as our own capacities for perception make them accessible to us. Our sense of sight, our sense of hearing, our sense of touch, our sense of taste. These senses color the world for us in a certain way. You know, some people like certain foods. Some people don't like certain foods. Uh, a food tastes good to me, but it doesn't taste good to you. Uh, I can see things not so well because my eyesight is bad. You can see things really clearly. Uh, so the way things appear to us is at least in part and always a result of the way we are and not only of the way things are. Um, we don't just experience the world directly. We experience the world simultaneously with ourselves. And so that means whenever we make a judgment on the way things seem to us, we should never just say, okay, it seems to me that P, some proposition, some idea, right? Whatever it might be. Um, or we should, rather, we should not just say, okay, P is true, some proposition. Rather, what we, what we strictly can say is that to me, such as I am right now, it seems like P, okay? But when I say that, I am already admitting the possibility that I'm false because I'm not just making a statement about reality. I'm making a statement about reality as it is visible or as it is apparent to me. And when I qualify its appearance, when I qualify that statement by relativizing it to me, I also simultaneously admit that my opinion could be wrong. So I should never just say, you know, S is P, subject is predicate, whatever, some sentence. I should always say, it seems to me such as I am right now that S is P. But when I say that, I'm also admitting that um, I could be wrong about this idea. I could be wrong about what it is that it seems to me to be. Uh, so therefore, my opinions are all fallible and revisable. That doesn't mean that I'm wrong about everything. It just means that I cannot be sure that I'm right. Uh, so that's the, those are those, these are the two reasons why I think there is no room for uh, infallibility in you know, in theology or really any other sort of rational inquiry. Uh, and they're strictly phenomenological reasons. They're reasons that have to do with how we experience things. In the first place, every experience is multiply interpretable. We can say that this thing that appears to us is X, or we can say that it appears, it resembles an X, but is not in fact one. And in the second place, every experience that we have of things in the world is simultaneously an experience of ourselves. And it's our powers of perception and our habits of thinking that color the world for us in a certain way. And so already when we say that things are so-and-so, uh, really what we should be saying is that things seem to us such as we are right now to be so-and-so. And when we say that, we are admitting the possibility that we don't have the truth. We are admitting the possibility that we could be wrong. Uh, so for strictly phenomenological reasons uh, that just have to do with how inquiry works, how rational inquiry into things outside of ourselves our side of ourselves works at all, uh, there is no room, there's no place for a pretense to infallibility. We should always admit the possibility that we could be wrong. Now, again, this doesn't mean that we are wrong about everything. It just means that we should not pretend to be infallible. We should not claim infallibility for ourselves. I think there's a lot of fascinating rabbit trails to chase here, and I'm going to have to restrain myself to only chase a few of them. But I, there, there are certain ones I want to get to, and I also want to, as always, try to embody maybe some of the, the questions that the audience might have at this point that they just don't have the privilege of asking in real time. So I can imagine some people maybe bristling at the idea of a certain relativity here, right? I, I think what you said there makes sense. You know, there's all of our knowing requires us as a knower, right? Like there, there is this subject involved in all of these and all of our experiences also involve us experiencing ourselves. And when you talk about something like the Copernican revolution and realizing, oh, actually, you know, the earth revolves around the sun. We were wrong about that. I think everyone wants to recognize, okay, yeah, like there are some positions that we hold 
that are subject to further evidence and then we come to a different conclusion. And I, I think we're basically everyone's gonna be on the same page there. For whatever reason, I, I could posit, or I could hypothesize why I think this might be, but I think a lot of people might be uncomfortable putting articles of faith in that same category. While they will say that with, you know, heliocentricity, they aren't so comfortable saying, I don't know, something like God is Trinity is at, in that same category. Now, I, w I would imagine the onus would be to explain why it isn't in the same category, but I also want to ask to clarify, to what extent can there be uh, hmm, like ranges of certainty? Or I guess certainty probably doesn't permit range, but uh, a, a spectrum of confidence, let's say it that way, in an opinion that you hold, right? So I can hold X position and say, it seems to me that X is true but I might hold that with like say 51% confidence, whereas I might hold another thing with 90% confidence, or at least that's how it ex I'm experiencing that. Is that an acceptable thing? Because I, I think what people worry about here, not just that things could be revisable or, or subject to further information, but that suddenly everything is on an equal plane of this like radical skepticism. Like, I don't even know that I exist. I don't know that S is P. I think that's where people's minds might be going right now as they hear you mm -hmm. say that. So I'd be curious both is just to make sure what we're saying is not only theology should is not infallible, but really nothing is infallible. So we yeah. are putting those things in the same categories, but within that, are we able to say with more level of confidence that say, I don't know, uh, let's say Jesus rose from the dead, then Jesus has two natures in one person with two wills or something like that. Mm -hmm. Well, um, the first thing that I would say is that not everything is subject to this kind of skepticism. Uh, so here is where I am very much appreciative of the philosophy of the French phenomenologist, Michel Henry. He's probably the, the one phenomenologist who is most influential on my thinking and who has uh, most profoundly impacted my, my intellectual work. And, Michel Henry will mention that, you know, everybody just sort of takes for granted, and this was taken for granted in the, in the uh, Western philosophical tradition for a long time, uh, that basically all things are on, you know, appear in the same way. Basically, everything appears as an object uh, to consciousness. So basically, everything appears as something that uh, is out there in the world and that you think about, that you target your consciousness towards. Uh, everything appears as an object. All right. And whatever is an object basically is not me. OK, so um, this glass, for example, is an object. Now, to say that it's an object is to say that my attention can be turned toward it, but uh, turned toward it as something other than me. It appears uh, in what phenomenologists call the, the world, right? This, this massive uh, uh, environment of manifestation where objects appear. Now, Michel Henry is going to say that not everything appears in the world. And not all experience is an experience of an object. Um, we, as living beings, have an experience of ourselves. Um, and notice, when we talk about an experience of ourself, there is no more distance to be spanned. Um, it's not that I am spanning this distance to uh, an external object by means of my powers of perception and my capacity for interpretation and so on. Uh, as a living being, I experience myself constantly. I know that I'm alive, right? Nothing is more certain than the fact that I am alive. Um, I may not know exactly what pain is or, you know, what uh, uh, neurophysiological um, uh, events or phenomena are correlated with pain, but I certainly know what pain is as I feel it. I know that I am in pain, right, because I'm, I'm feeling myself immediately. Uh, I know when I'm hungry because I've, I feel myself to be hungry. Uh, so in the domain of life, I'm experiencing myself, uh, whereas in the world, so to speak, are, you know, is this outside uh, where there are a bunch of objects that are appearing and that I can relate Two, uh, I can focus my attention on them, but my access to them is mediated by means of various capacities and powers that I have. So, you know, for example, is it uncertain that I exist? No, of course it. it of course, it's not uncertain. I can be more sure of anything than uh, I. I can't be sure of anything else than that I exist because I am constantly experiencing myself. I'm not experiencing something other than myself. I'm experiencing myself, and so for that reason, there isn't this uncertainty. There isn't this uh, intrinsic fallibility as there would be in the case of something outside of myself. Um, now, 
I would also say this. Um, I have a video on my YouTube channel where I make this argument in longer detail. So if you don't mind me sort of advertising my channel, I would recommend that anybody who has this question, go and watch the video on deconstruction and faith. Uh, because basically what I try to argue in that video, uh, I comment on this, you know, this phenomenon of deconstruction that had been taking place among evangelical celebrities and musicians and so on. Um, and what I try to argue in that video is that in the first place, they don't take the deconstruction far enough because they don't realize that actually all of their opinions can be subjected to deconstructive criticism, even the ones that they have now. On the other hand, uh, I argue that deconstruction and realizing this truth about the essential fallibility of our opinions does not undermine faith in God because actually God is accessed differently. Um, uh, and Michel Henry gives our, this argument. I may not be certain about my opinions about things out there in the world, but I am certain of the fact that I exist. I know that I live. At the same time, um, I am not the one who brought myself into the condition of living. Um, and there's nothing that I can do uh, to secure even a moment's life more, right? Because having life is the precondition of all my actions. There's not an action that I can uh, perform in order to gain life for myself because I would already have to be alive in order to act. So my being alive is basically the prior condition of everything. My being alive is what makes it possible for me to experience the world. My being alive is what makes it possible for me to uh, do things, to pursue my goals and so on. And yet I am not responsible for this fact of being alive. And so Michel Henry says that in this realization of our own fundamental passivity towards our being alive, that is where the, the point of contact between ourselves and God lies. Because God for Michel Henry is absolute life. Uh, he is this absolute life, which brings us into life by sharing his life with us. Uh, the, the phrase that Michel Henry uses is that God engenders us in his own life. Um, so I know that I'm living, I know that I have life, but I don't give myself this life. There's nothing that I can do to keep it for even a second. I'm constantly receiving it. And so that means that I must be constantly receiving it from God who has life in himself, who just is life. Um, and my life comes to me from God. So um, I would argue that not only do, uh, does the recognition of fallibility, uh, the fallibility of our opinions, not undermine um, faith in God, it actually points us to where God is actually found in our own experience of ourselves as fundamentally passive towards the undeniable fact of our living. I know that I live and yet I know that I cannot be responsible for this fact of my living. Uh, so because as a finite living creature, I have something that I cannot account for myself, I must receive it from God, the absolute and infinite life who shares his life with me and brings me into life uh, by engendering me, uh, you might say in his own life. Um, so. There is a lot more that we would have to say about all this, but basically to give a short response, um, I would say that the recognition of the fallibility of our opinions does not mean uh, that everything is on a playing on, on a level playing field because the things that I cannot be mistaken, the things that I can be mistaken about are my judgments about things outside of myself. I cannot be mistaken about the fact that I'm alive because I'm constantly experiencing myself. There is no distance to be traversed hermeneutically. I'm just experiencing myself. And it is precisely in this experience of myself where I recognize the fundamental passivity of myself towards my own living uh, that I find God. Um, you know, and so uh, Michel Henry says that uh, actually everybody knows God. Uh, he quotes a line from Meister Eckhart who says that uh, the human being is uh, ein Gott wissender Mensch, a human being that knows God. Why is that? Because God is closer to us than anything else, closer to me than you, closer to me than the clothes that I'm wearing, closer to me than any of my opinions, is God who is constantly breathing life into me, who is constantly giving me life. Uh, just like, for example, a musician produces music by constantly playing the instrument. God uh, is constantly giving me life. And so in the very fact of my living, towards which I'm utterly passive, that's where the point of contact is with with me and God. Uh, so that's a, that's a long answer once more, but hopefully it, it will serve to maybe, you know, um, uh, respond to some of these objections that might be coming up. I think it does. And I think that's very helpful also to give kind of the source of that there so that if people want to check out that the video, I'll, I'll, I'll try to remember to link to it. I am notoriously bad at remembering to link things that I say like three quarters of the way into the video that I'll link, but I'll definitely link everything from the description and they can find it or from the bio, they can find it from there. Sure. But they should definitely check out that video. And also uh, 
Michelle Henry, I believe, was the... Yeah, Michelle Henry. Uh, and one book that I would recommend that people read from him is Words of Christ. It okay. was the last book that he ever published, and it was basically a kind of summary statement of his philosophy in a more accessible mode than you would find in, in his previously published books. So he's got a lot of books, and he says more or less the same thing in all of his books. Uh, but his philosophy can be very abstract. In Words of Christ, he tries to be as plain and as simple and as accessible as possible. Uh, so that, I think, would be a good starting point for anybody who's interested in learning more about him. I love plain, simple, and accessible. So I'll start there with his work. Um, but th thanks for that recommendation there. So I think people are be hopefully able to see how this would probably circle back to you finding these kind of epistemic problems with Roman Catholicism. I, I imagine this is at the core of it, but I, I don't want to put that um, into your own words. So if we kind of bring this full circle here, you were interested in Roman Catholicism, you almost became Catholic, but then you didn't, in part because of phenomenology. Is that how, was the kind of, uh, the, the linchpin of that, this idea of infallibility? Is, is that how phenomenology kind of undermined the Roman Catholic theological system for you? Or is there other things that phenomenology hits on that began to unravel that system for you? So not, uh, not long ago, I would have said that the issue of infallibility is the principal problem, uh, the pretense to infallibility. Once you, once you get rid of that, you basically do away with Roman Catholic theology, because of course, Roman Catholic theology takes for granted that uh, the church can uh, claim to speak infallibly and that it, it can take its pronouncements to be true and to take them for granted as true, um, you know, just as a matter of, as a matter of uh, definition. But um, actually, I would say that the problem is even more basic than that. And now as I, as I think back and as I try to understand my intellectual journey to get to this point, I think that this was the problem from the beginning. Um, but it has taken me a little while and I've been kind of um, shedding light on this problem just in bits and pieces. Now I think I get the whole picture. And so I will try to explain what I think is the problem with Roman Catholic theology, but also I, I will go so far as to say that the problem that I'm about to mention will apply to Eastern Orthodox theology and even to certain more traditional statements of Protestant theology. Uh, so really my complaint is with the Catholic, once more lower, lowercase c, Catholic theological tradition in general, uh, as it involved in hist as it evolved in history, rather than with Roman Catholicism in particular, and I will try to explain what this is the problem. I will begin by an analogy uh, with a certain argument that is made in phenomenological uh, philosophy against the conception of consciousness called representationalism. Okay, uh, representationalism says that our experience, uh, this you know, our consciousness. Uh, is not an experience of real things directly. Representationalism says that what we experience are strictly speaking representations or images that are produced by our body as a result of its physical interaction with the environment, uh, just like a movie being projected. Uh, so the, the sphere of consciousness is basically the sphere of representations that are produced by our body. Um, now, the way things appear, you know, the appearance, the, the, this domain of appearance need not correlate with reality. Okay. The things that appear to me need not be real. And furthermore, the things that are real need not appear to me. So my experience, you know, this is like Descartes, uh, problem of the evil demon, right? Could it be that all my conscious experience is illusory? Maybe none of this is real. Um, you know, uh, consider also the, um, the brain in a vat, you know, thought experiment from philosophy. How do we know we're not in the matrix? How do we know we're not brains in a vat? And we have this rich world of experience, but none of it corresponds to anything real. Okay. Representationalism distinguishes between the world of experience and reality in that way. It says that they are two separate spheres. Uh, the world of experience is one sphere uh, and experience, strictly speaking, is representational. Now, these representations may or may not correspond to anything real. Okay, there may be real things that we are that do not show up in our representational consciousness, and there may be things in our representational consciousness that do not correspond to anything real. So the two spheres, appearance and reality, are separate and independent of one another. Um, now, the argument that phenomenologists bring against this view is that if that's true, we land in skepticism, right? We can never know if any of our representations are adequate. Now, why not? 
because it's impossible to ex escape the sphere of representation in order to compare our representations with the real things themselves. It's impossible for me to compare my experiences with reality if all my experiences are representations. I mean, even that comparison would have to take place in an experience. And by definition, all experiences are representational, but do not necessarily correlate to reality. So representationalism distinguishes between uh, consciousness or experience and, and uh, you know, the world of experience and reality in such a way that it's impossible to escape you know, the sphere of consciousness in order to see whether or not our representations are adequate to the realities. I could never know whether my experience of things corresponds to the real world because I can't step outside of myself to experience things, you know, uh, to, to see the comparison, right? I'm always ever experiencing things as they appear to me, right? I, all I ever have are representations. Uh, so because all I ever have are representations and I can't step outside of the representation in order to compare it to the reality, I can't know if anything that I experience is real. Now, the representationalists have a response to this argument. Uh, they admit that the sphere of appearance and the sphere of being are separate, right? They're, they're fundamentally independent spheres. Um, what appears need not be real and what is real need not appear, okay? Nevertheless, there are uh, certain signals that occur within the sphere of appearance uh, that function as signs for us, right? So when we when our representations are adequate, this adequacy is signaled to us by what are called feelings of evidence or feelings of certainty, right? So um, even though I cannot step outside of myself in order to compare my representational consciousness with reality, nevertheless, there occurs within my representational consciousness certain feelings of certainty or feelings of, of clarity or of evidence that signal to me that my representational consciousness is matching with reality. Um, so they try to overcome, uh, the representationalist tries to overcome this independence and this uh, separation of the two spheres of appearance and reality by positing certain signals within the one sphere, the accessible sphere, that are, you know, correlate or they, they indicate when the two spheres are correlated. So the, the correlation of the accessible sphere of representation with the inaccessible sphere of reality is signaled by these feelings of certainty. The phenomenological response is that you can have feelings of certainty about virtually anything, and so they're, use, they're useless as a criteria of truth. And I can give an example, right? Anytime you change your opinion on some matter of metaphysics or some matter of ethics or some matter of history, okay, you can go from being perfectly convinced of something to being perfectly convinced against it. But opinions, you know, the realities of those spheres don't change. It's not like the truths of metaphysics changed, right? They are what they are. Uh, it's not like the truths of history changed, right? Suppose you were convinced that something happened in history and then you came to be convinced that it didn't happen. It's not as if the truth of history changed. The truth of history was what it was. It's just that you came to feel convinced about one opinion and, you, and then later you came to feel convinced about another opinion. But notice, it's the same feeling. It's the same conviction. You, you, feel, you felt just as certain the first time as you did the second time. Um, but the truth cannot have changed. So this shows that the signal that you are proposing as an indicator of the correlation of the two spheres is in, unstable, right? You have that signal when the correlation is not there, um, and you might not have the signal even when the correlation is there. So you can be right about something, but not feel sure. Um, you know, you, you, could, you could have the truth, and yet because you don't feel sure, uh, there would be a correlation between the spheres of representation and the spheres of being that does not have a signal. It's not signaled by anything. So basically what I argue, uh, and I've, I've argued this in my volume, Orthodoxy and Heresy, uh, and I'm also arguing this in a new book that I'm writing called Theology of the Manifest. This is like my, my next big project. Uh, basically, I'm arguing that representationalism follows what I call a logic of the inaccessible, right? You have two spheres. You have an accessible sphere and an inaccessible sphere. They're independent. They don't need to correlate with each other, but you want something that's in the inaccessible sphere. So you have to posit a signal in the sphere of the accessible that indicates to you when the inaccessible thing is there for you. Um, this, this is the logic of the inaccessible. You distinguish between two spheres. You say that they're uncorrelated and independent, but you posit a signal within one sphere to let you know when you're in the possession of something in the other sphere. Now, this, the, the logic of the inaccessible is unstable because precisely because these two spheres are independent of one another, the signal can appear without there being any correlated reality, and the reality can appear without there being any correlated signal, right? So uh, the only way that you could get the signal to... to to be reliable 
is if there was a law, right? The, the, uh, the inaccessible reality uh, and the signal behaved according to a law that perfectly predicted their correlation. But if, they, if there's a law that can be given that describes their behavior, then they belong to the same sphere. They're not separate spheres anymore. The two spheres would not be independent of each other, but they would actually be correlated. Um, so this is the, you know, but, and then that goes against the definite, yeah, that goes against the, the presumed distinction of the spheres. So basically the argument is that representationalism follows a logic of the inaccessible. Um, and the problem with the logic of the inaccessible is this instability of the signal. If I posit a signal within one sphere that is supposed to indicate to me when something else is going on in the other sphere, but those two spheres are unrelated and uncorrelated to each other, uh, then the signal, the, the connection between, the, co the correlation between, between them can only be accidental and contingent. Um, now that was a very abstract discussion, but now let's move on to the domain of Catholic theology. My argument is that Catholic theology actually operates according to this logic of the inaccessible. Okay, and you find the first, you find a clear statement of this in Thomas Aquinas at the very beginning of his Summa Theologiae. He's, he asked the question, is sacred doctrine necessary? Why can't philosophy do it all? Okay, philosophy for him basically just refers to all those sciences and, and fields of inquiry that are possible for human beings given their natural endowments. Okay, so everything that a human being is naturally capable of investigating, um, everything that a, a human being is naturally capable of knowing, that belongs to the sphere of philosophy. Why is sacred doctrine necessary in addition to philosophy? Can't philosophy just do it all? Um, he basically says that uh, there are things that are that belong to our salvation, that have to be revealed to us by God, which are philosophically inaccessible. You cannot get at them by means of natural reason. Um, and these things are things on which our salvation depends. So notice he's distinguishing between the, the sphere of the salvation and the sphere of philosophy. And there are things in the sphere of salvation which are inaccessible from the sphere of philosophy. The sphere of philosophy is where we start. Uh, therefore, these things that are necessary for us but are inaccessible to us have to be given to us. The sphere of the sacred has to, the sphere of salvation has to somehow come down to us. But if the two spheres are different, then when the sphere of salvation comes down to us, it's going to have to be manifest in some way uh, by means of the things that belong to our sphere. Um, and so, you know, then in Roman Catholic theology, you have the idea of the motives of credibility. Um, maybe you've heard this, uh, people talking about this. Why should you believe that what the Roman Catholic Church teaches is true, even though it cannot prove to you without a shadow of a doubt that what it teaches is true? Well, because all of these miracles and all these things that happen uh, in the Roman Catholic Church are signals that what it teaches is true, even though they are strictly unrelated, right? So a miracle can happen, and that doesn't mean that what you say is true. Uh, but the motives of credibility are proposed as signals of the truth of Catholic teaching, even though, strictly speaking, they're logically unrelated. Um, so here we see the logic of the inaccessible at work. You have this sphere of sacred doctrine, which is philosophically inaccessible. It's revealed. It's not something that people have natural access to. It comes down to us from above, supposedly. Um, but you know where to find it because of these motives of credibility. Now, the obvious counter argument is, that's gonna, is that there's going to be no connection between those two. There are miracles in other religions. There are holy people in other religions. Why should we believe that the Roman Catholic Church's teaching is true rather than the miraculous teachers of other uh, religions? So... Anytime you posit these signals from within one sphere that are supposed to indicate to you the presence of something from another sphere, they're going to fall apart. There's going to be a logical invalidity there. There's going to be a non sequitur. Uh, think also of what, um, you know, Vince, Vincent of Laurent says in his Vincentian canon, right? How do you distinguish the, um, how do you distinguish the Catholic truth uh, from the falsehood of heretical pravity? He says, Scripture is more than sufficient for teaching us all things. And yet, because everybody interprets Scripture in different ways, you need the rule of ecclesial interpretation. All right. So already, Scripture, he says, contains what we need for salvation. But the meaning of Scripture is inaccessible to us because look at its interpretability. Look at how ambiguous it is. Look at how many different interpretations there are. So the truth of Scripture is inaccessible to us. We need these other things that are going to indicate to us when we have that truth. And what he posits are, you know, antiquity, consent, and ubiquity. What everybody in the whole church believes everywhere, uh, what all the, you know, according to the consenting definitions of the fathers and priests of previous generations, um, you know, what is believed by most or by all and so on uh, from the beginning. So Vincenti the Vincentian canon also functions according to this logic of the inaccessible. 
He says that the saving knowledge is not accessible to us through scripture because look at how interpretable it is and how ambiguous it is. Therefore, you know that you have the saving knowledge when you have these signals. Uh, you have something that was believed everywhere, always and by all. You have something that was uh, affirmed by all or at least most of the holy fathers and ancestors of the past uh, and interpreted according to their interpretation, such as they understood them. Uh, so Catholic theology functions according to this logic of the inaccessible that I think actually is logically invalid. Okay, so you want to know what the truth is, but instead of giving you the truth, Vincent just points you to a certain number of teachers. And notice also that there's a circularity at play in his canon. Uh, he says we should only hold those truths which were held by all or most uh, or nearly all of the Holy Fathers and ancestors. Okay, who counts as a Holy Father and ancestor? Why should Athanasius rather than Arius be a Holy Father and ancestor? Why should Irenaeus rather than Marcion be a Holy Father and ancestor? Well, already to call certain people Holy Fathers and ancestors is to take a stance that fundamentally agrees with them. You wouldn't call them a Holy Father if you didn't already agree with them. Um, so the Vincentian canon, if we interpret these terms very specifically, uh, then we've just basically loaded the dice. We've stacked the deck ahead of time and we've come, uh, we've basically just uh, um, confirmed the Catholic truth of our own convictions because we belong to a tradition of people who affirm the same things as us. On the other hand, if you don't define these terms very precisely, then you get the result that nobody, there is no statement of faith. There is no doctrine that has been agreed upon by quite everybody. So the more precisely you define the terms in the canon, um, you know, the more circular the canon is. It becomes basically a tool by means of which a particular tradition can affirm its own Catholicity. Uh, but if you don't define the terms very specifically, then it becomes useless. It, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't help us to distinguish between substantial theological opinions. So basically what i'm what i've been trying to show in all these examples is that um catholic theology functions according to this logic of the inaccessible okay it says basically that we're concerned with the saving truth which is naturally inaccessible to human beings it has to be revealed uh you will not find it just by doing you know investigations uh, philosophical investigations or scientific investigations of the earth uh, there's 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 the uh there's need of a special theological epistemology uh, and you know where to find this saving truth, not because you'll recognize it when you see it, but because it is signaled by certain indicators. There are certain things that occur within our sphere that signal the presence of this saving truth. Now, what are those things? Well, the Holy Fathers and ancestors, the motives of credibility and all these other things. But strictly speaking, there's no connection between those two things, right? Miracles occur in all kinds of religions and those religions are false, but yet somehow Catholicism is supposed to be true. Um, the Vincentian canon, right? Unless I assume your tradition, I'm not going to agree that all the same people are fathers or ancestors. Um, on the other hand, if I don't assume your tradition, then your rule doesn't give me anything to work with. Uh, so basically, the the problem that I have with, with Catholic theology, and I, I wish that we had more time. I know that we're running out of time here, so I wish I had more time. I will send you materials, and I, maybe I'll release a video on this stuff later. But basically, the argument that I'm trying to suggest here is that uh, Catholic theology, lowercase c Catholic theology, functions according to this logic of the inaccessible, which compromises it epistemically. It talks about possessing things, but the only thing it has for sure are signals, purported signals of these non-manifest realities. Um, but uh, I, don't, I don't think that that works. I don't, you know, I, I, I don't agree that if the manifest and the non-manifest spheres are uncorrelated, that you can have a signal. Um, uh, it, you know, it's, it's the same problem with representationalism. Now, the representationalist can just, you know, pound the table and say, no, I, my representations are true, even though there is nothing about them that guarantees that they're true, even though the sphere of representation and the sphere of reality are uncorrelated, even though the signals that I posit are not necessarily correlated with any realities. Nevertheless, I have the truth. And that's what the Roman Catholic or the, you know, the lower KC Catholic in general can do. Even though there is no strict connection between the occurrence of miracles and the truth of teaching, even though there is no strict correlation between what people said in the past and what is actually true, the actual truth, you know, the facts of the matter about which they were speaking, even though there's no strict correlation between these things, nevertheless, this opinion is true. And you can take that, you know, sort of sectarian and dogmatic and table pounding approach, but I don't agree that it's rational at that point. Um, you know, maybe there's nothing that I can say that will convince you, but I don't agree that you've established the truth of your opinion. I don't agree that you even have good reasons to suppose that your opinion is true. I just think that you have, you know, this tight logical circle that you've been operating within. You have a tradition um, and you've just been going around and around within that tradition, but you haven't yet come to touch terra firma. You haven't yet touched reality uh, as such. 
That that was really helpful. I think people might need to watch that maybe twice because there is a lot there. But I, I think people will be able to make those connections even if they have to, to work through it. But, but it's worth working through. And good thought often takes a little bit of work to really get to the meat of this. this these are deep things. Uh, there's a, a lot more we could cover. I, we are getting short on time here. I, I do want to ask just, just one final thing. Um, but because I, I think this is uh, really where I want to end up and also maybe the most difficult thing in theology, right, is not only showing where we've gone wrong, but positing where we could go right. And mm-hmm. so having recognized these issues, what's the solution? Because I, I think for a long time, so many people, and you didn't use these categories, so maybe they're not accurate, but these categories of like general revelation and special revelation, um, back to Aquinas with like uh, natural philosophy and, and whatnot, um, or, or the natural mind. So w- what I sense is this movement towards kind of getting rid of special revelation as a prioritized category, or even like whether that category actually makes sense. Um, but, but what does theology under this mode look like? Yes. Um, in my, um, <clears throat> in my published works, I have called it, and also in my dissertation, I've called it theology without anathemas. Um, that's also the title that I use in my forthcoming volume on orthodoxy and heresy in Christian theology. Um, and essentially theology without anathemas means approaching theology with a concern to speak truthfully about things. Right. So Aristotle gave this wonderful definition of truth. He said, uh, truth is to say of what is that it is and to say of what is not that it is not. So when you speak about a thing as it is, then you've spoken truthfully. It seems to me that the way forward for theology is to strive to speak truthfully about things. Now, that means that you give up on this preoccupation with orthodoxy and heresy. And this is where I know, you know, everybody's hair will stand up on their neck and I will be the new, you know, the new devil (laughs) uh, uh, to be exercised from the internet. But um, orthodoxy and heresy, as I explain in my book, are relations that obtain between ideas. Okay, one idea is heretical because it is excluded or incompatible by other ideas which are taken to be orthodox. Truth, however, according to the Aristotelian definition, is a relation between an idea and a thing. So the idea is the idea of a thing, it's about a thing, and that thing itself is what makes the idea to be true or false. The idea is true if it's adequate to its object, and the idea is false if it is not adequate to its object. So orthodoxy and heresy, has to do with the relation between ideas. Truth has to do with the relation between an idea and a reality to which it refers. It seems to me that so long as theology is concerned with these questions of orthodoxy and heresy, um, it never gets to reality. It just becomes a sort of a traditional discourse. It becomes talking about ideas and about what ideas are compatible with other ideas, right? And what's worst of all is that even though we're only talking about ideas, we take for granted that our ideas are true, right? So we assume that there's this automatic correspondence between orthodoxy and truth. Now, if you ask a person to prove his orthodox beliefs true, how easy is that to do? It's not easy at all. Um, And I think that when we actually try to prove our orthodox beliefs true, we run into those problems about fallibility that I mentioned earlier. We see that, you know, things are interpretable. You can say it means this, or you can say it means that. Um, you can say you can you you become aware of the fact that what we find, for example, in the sources is to some extent a reflection of what our own prior convictions are and what we're looking for. Um, so when you actually try to prove theological opinions true, you'll find that it's not easy to do. Uh, but you have to assume that your orthodox opinions are true, and so therefore you start positing all this other stuff that makes gives you ground for believing that it's true, even though you can't prove it. For example, that it was affirmed by an ecumenical council, or that it was taught, you know, um, ex cathedra by the pope. These are all just signals. These are all just purported signals of the truth, right? The truth is inaccessible. I can't prove it, but I can show that in history at the Council of Nicaea in 325, the bishops affirmed so-and-so. Uh, so even though I don't have the thing itself, I have a signal which is supposed to indicate to me that I do have the thing itself. But again, the, 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 the Aristotelian definition of truth distinguishes speech and reality. The fact that things are the way they are, independently of what I say about them, is what makes it possible for me to speak falsely. I could not speak falsely if things always were whatever I said they were, right? The thing is what it is, independently of my speech. 
And so therefore, if I want to know the truth of a theological opinion, what good does it do me just to point to other people who say this, <laughs> right? You're giving me speech. I want the thing, uh, not speech, not opinions, not ideas, not a tradition of interpretation. I want the thing itself. Um, and so if you want the thing itself, and if you recognize that the thing itself is what makes your idea true, then you're never going to be satisfied by somebody simply pointing you to everything else except the thing itself. He points you to a pope who said it, or he points you, he points you to an ecumenical council. These are all just purported signals, right? And we know that the, 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 the sign is unstable, right? As long as you distinguish between two spheres, be, reality and speech, for example, and you say that they don't have to be correlated, you cannot get from one sphere by just multiplying instances of the other. You cannot get to reality by just multiplying what people say about things. Uh, the reality, it's, you have to go to the reality itself. You have to go to the thing itself, like, like Husserl said, like the phenomenologists say. So for me, Protestant theology, if it's really going to break free of these paradigms of thought and these frameworks uh, that were formed long before it came onto the scene uh, and that are a part of Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox theology, if it's really going to break free of these things uh, and sort of stand on its own feet as distinctly Protestant theology that is not just, you know, imitation Catholicism or whatever, it's going to have to, I think, it's going to have to abandon this preoccupation with orthodoxy and heresy because these, you know, orthodoxy and heresy, basically, you, um, you know, it just gets you caught up in the whole um, logic of the inaccessible and the two distinct spheres and so on. You have to set all that aside and just focus on speaking truthfully about things, just inquiring what is the truth of the matter in this theological issue. Now, I'm not the first person to say this. Wolfhard, uh, Wolfhard Pannenberg, for example, in the first volume, of his systematic theology in the first chapter, uh, basically makes exactly these arguments. Now, he doesn't use the terms that I do, but he does say there that theology has to be concerned with the truth of what it says, and it should not be satisfied with just the consensus of the Holy Fathers or whatever else. Um, that's kind of what I'm saying. Truth means that my idea is adequate to the thing itself. And if I wanna know if my opinions are true, then I have to go to the thing itself. I do not just go to other people who talk about it, right? Because that's just more speech. Those are just more opinions. I wanna move beyond opinions to get to the reality. Um, and it seems to me that if theology is gonna do that, then it's gonna have to abandon the, the preoccupation with orthodoxy and heresy, which basically is just a relation between ideas and has nothing to do with the truth, strictly speaking. All right. Thank you for that. I, I know that was not a lot of time to get that last answer in. And perhaps when, when the volume comes out, we can do a conversation specifically about that idea of orthodoxy and heresy, because I, I know there's a, a lot more you'd probably like to say there. Well, Dr. Nemesh, thank you so much for your time today. I know we have gone a little long, and so I, I think we'll wrap it up there. But I, I am really grateful for your time, and I encourage everyone to go check out uh, all of your work over on your channel or on your website, which I'll have linked uh, below. But until next time, I'll tell everyone uh, to be on the lookout for more videos. But as always, most importantly, go out and love God and love others, because truly, above all else, that will change the world.